Thanks so much. So we are going to talk about the, the Internet of Things and whether it's a friend or foe to marketers. Um, but first I want to say, Game Theory, you're, you're, a, you're a marketing foresight company. Yes. You, you use analytics to help your, your clients figure out how to digest their data and where to spend their ad dollars. So why are you interested in Internet of Things? What's, what's interesting there? Well, the internet is now entering a new phase. We've got two billion people that are now connected online and lots of devices that are being connected as well. And so we've got cars, buildings, everyday items such as clothes, watches, fridges that are now communicating with one another digitally. Effectively, what we've got is machine to machine communication. And that communication implies that there's an exchange of information, an exchange of data. So whether it's my Fitbit that's calculating the number of steps that I'm doing every day or an app that's um, collecting information about the number of vacant parking spaces in a parking lot across a city, there's just a huge amount of data that these devices are now generating. And so being able to collate, to organize, to make sense of that data, to be able to hone in on the insight that results in meaningful change is quite a challenge. And so making sense of that data and helping clients to process it in a fast and efficient way is what we at Game Theory effectively do. So what are those opportunities for your clients? I mean, what, what are some of the things that you've done? Well, um, I guess the opportunities are, I mean, the. The Internet of Things is still in its very early days and the rise of the Internet Connected Object is um, re um, getting towards lots of different opportunities. We've got convenience for consumers, we've got things like um, large organisations taking advantage of the efficiencies that are there, but also opportunities that are really kind of disrupting the marketplace. So for me they kind of fall into two main buckets of efficiency and convenience and nest the um, ability to control your heating from an app anywhere in the world is a great example of efficiency and convenience. The other bucket is where you've got a product or a service that's being developed that nobody previously imagined that's completely disrupting mm. the way that we think about things and I guess a lot of that has happened in medical science. So every year you've got um, diabetics who, because of their condition, they um, have problems with their eyesight, their limbs, and we're now at a stage where we can insert a device that can constantly monitor blood glucose levels and relay that information back to an app, allowing that patient to see whether their blood sugar is too high, too low, and then actually do you know, something about it. That information then can be relayed back to a general practitioner um, who can call the patient in. So, I mean, that's an example of a world that we never previously imagined as a result of the innovation in the technology. I think short term, what we're probably going to see as per Billy's presentation is in smart garments and wearables. So I think um, Gartner said that um, in 2016, there's going to be 26 million garments shipped across the world. That's a lot, a lot of, of underwear. That's a lot of underwear. <laughs> and I guess at the moment, a lot of what's being created, it's fun, it's gimmicky. Um, it doesn't necessarily always have a purpose. But the entire fashion industry is based on people buying products based on de desirability and not really purpose. But I think for mass adoption to really take place, these um, products really need to have, yes, the desirability, but they also need to have some degree of purpose at an affordable price point. And I wonder, for an, on our audience, how many of you, say, have a Nest thermostat at home, have a Fitbit, have some sort of connected wearable or device that you're using? Show of hands. There so you that's, go. that's quite a lot. So we're all consumers here, as well as marketers, uh, and uh, you know that this is a lot of data that we're turning over, you know, through these devices. I mean, you talk about it, you know, these machine-to-machine -machine communications and that exchange of information. So clearly, there's there's questions, right, and, and some challenges that that arises, uh, f you know, when we're just looking at the sheer amount of information now that we're we're giving up or we're offering up in exchange yeah. for a utility. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about how you see 
you know, approaching that challenge and, and those questions? Well, I guess there's, um, you know, there is a darker side to all of this. Um, we think about things like security, vulnerabilities, the rise of consumerism and the fact that, um, you know, it's having an impact on society. But then with all of these devices that are monitoring us, tracking us, collecting all of this data, there's a concern about the whole kind of big brother sort of surveillance aspect of it as well. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's a number of concerns. I guess um, more so than... I get, well, let's take hacking as an example. So we all know about Fiat Chrysler and the 1.4 million vehicles that they've had to recall as a result of a researcher just kind of playing about hacking into the system and taking um, control of this car. And so, you know, I think that a lot of developers are more concerned with creating the technology than the security that sits behind that technology. And um, there's a guy at MIT, Sanjay Sama, and he says that the main worry is artificial stupidity, not artificial intelligence, because um, people are more concerned uh, about the, the features as opposed to the security, and that we end up designing um, systems that are um, either poorly designed or have got some degree of flaw in them. I guess data is a major um, concern with um, how do we protect that and make sure that we're kind of controlling that. Um, we buy a device, an internet connected device, and we would assume that we own that data or we have some degree of control over right. that data. That's not always the case though. That's not always the case. And I think, you know, we're living in a world where there are quite a few people that would be quite happy to license their data to another company in exchange for, for the device itself. And I'm sure there's plenty of people that would quite happily license their data to Apple in exchange for a, an iWatch. Mm -hmm. um, so, and we're already doing that. I mean, Facebook have a license to use our content in whatever way they feel they want to. They can also um, sub-license that content to, to third parties as well. I think from a, a marketing perspective, we need to be wary of the fact that we're going to have access to a lot of um, personal data and personal information. And our brands are um, dependent on how much care we take over that data. So I think that's something that um, marketers and brands need to be mindful of. So, so what is the opportunity for an advertiser, you know, in this device? I mean, we're not really we're not really talking about you know pop up ads on your Apple Watch, but but where can a marketer, an agency, an advertiser play a role on this on these devices, whether it's underwear or a virtual reality headset? I mean, well, there's lots of opportunities. Um, the amount of data that we're now going to have access to, all of this personalised information really gives a marketer the ability to really connect and engage with a consumer and ultimately sell. I mean, as you say, it'd be really easy to slap yet another display ad onto a device, but in my mind, that would be quite lazy. Um, all of this data is actually gonna put marketing folks into a very unique situation. They're gonna have access to all of this information that will allow them to innovate in a way that's never been possible before. And they'll be the ones that will be able to come up with the products and the services that really engage um, consumers. Um, so I think that that's, that's a massive opportunity to be able to kind of be able to personalize all of that as well. I mean, I've seen examples of ads that are great ads in terms of being interactive. And British Airways did that billboard campaign where they used real-time data of planes flying overhead and um, being able to kind of show the interaction as it was happening. But I don't see that many examples of what I would class as a connected campaign. Mm -hmm. So to some degree, the fitness brands are starting to do this. So with Nike and their fitness app, right. They've, what they've done is they've created this community of like-minded individuals that have access to hundreds of workouts. Now, these individuals are quite happy to give up their data in order to have 
access to those workouts, an online personal trainer, rewards, motivation, information about what their, their friends and their peers are doing. Really content at this point. Absolutely. Yeah. And that sort of engagement with the brand and having that connected community is far more powerful than just doing an advertising campaign using online, offline, just advertising kind of a pair of sneakers. So, you know, there, there is a real opportunity here to create a connection with con consumers. Now, when we talk about the data and, and the data privacy issue, I mean, I think we've all, I'm sure we've all gone through, scanned those terms and conditions and clicked at the bottom without really reading it. So, you know, is there any sense of how much the scale of what we're turning over, the scale of what's out there, that's both, you know, from, from, we'd be of concern to the consumer potentially, but also the opportunity for the marketer. Well, I guess we're now at a stage where we can assign an IP address to every single object on the planet. Now, that's a lot of IP addresses yeah. and that's a lot of devices. Um, I think a recent study said that there were 13 billion internet connected devices and that number is set to double in the next few years. So, in fact, according to Cisco, by the end of this decade, we'll have 50 billion internet connected devices. And I think that's probably an underestimate. Mm -hmm. So we've got all of these devices pinging each other, all of this data kind of being created. So, you know, the, the need to be able to organize that data in a way that we can access it and do something meaningful it is a challenge. You know, we're going to be very much dependent on automation mm -hmm. and, and a lot of machine learning. But how ready are consumers for a lot of this kind of machine learning ability? Now, it's one thing for me. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, what, what does that look like as a consumer? What would that look like? Well, so at the moment, I can take my, my phone, I can scan something, I can retrieve that information um, at a time that's convenient for me, and that's kind of quite cool. I can walk through an airport, I can get through security, I get to the other end, and on my iPhone, up pops an ad for a perfume that I regularly buy at Duty Free. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. I walk into Duty Free, and a complete stranger walks up to me greets me by name as a result of facial recognition, that for some consumers would be a creepy. little bit creepy. <laughs> Potentially creepy. Yeah, a little bit creepy. And I think there is this <laughs> fine line between what's cool and what's classed as creepy. Mm. And so, you know, I would say that, you know, within the marketing community, I think it's really important that we, we go out and we test and we use this data. We use the information that's available to drive different types of campaigns and kind of get ahead of the curve. But I think when it comes to brands and brand reputation, we kind of need to be mindful of that. But I think there's a huge opportunity to also stretch the brands into new areas in a way that we never thought possible. I mean, contactless payment has been around for a long time, but now Apple, with the Apple Pay, are kind of moving into this market, almost acting as an intermediary. And that's kind of got the potential to really disrupt the financial okay. services industry. That's bringing something that we never kind of imagined previously. So I think brands need to all think of themselves, not just as the industry that they're in, but think of themselves as technology companies. And in fact, there's a session running this afternoon talking about um, the marketing technologist yep. and that intersection between the CMO and the CIO. And I think the boundaries are going to get more and more blurred on that. Absolutely.